Take your copy of God's Word and turn with me to Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. One of uh, the difficulties that we have been working out and working through is that we have a, a long argument from the Apostle Paul that we've been doing in short segments. And so I want to express my appreciation to the elders who, working through these and with some pretty serious overlaps, as I've read the sermons and profited from them myself, I know there was a lot of hard work that went into that. And I hope that you have listened, you have profited, you have learned that God has done his work in your life through the word. And so once again, we take up then our Bibles in Colossians 3. And though we are focusing on verses 10 through 17, we'll reach back a little bit so that um, we are on the same run as Paul has been taking us on. And the main question that is posed to us, not only in this section of Colossians, but really through the whole first part of the book, is will we live with each other as God's people in a way that is gospel-grounded, Christ-centered, and God-glorifying. Now, we've been headed there, but now this morning in this text, this all comes to a head. Will we live together as God's people in a way that's grounded in the gospel, that is centered on Christ, the truths about him, and will be God-glorifying. So what Christ did for us on the, through the cross and the resurrection are realities. We cannot feel them. They're not part of the physical realm, as far as we can tell. We cannot experience them except by believing them by faith. But they are nonetheless realities. They are true. And this is the gospel for our Christian life. And Paul is driving this home. And now the exhortations move into the sphere of our relationships, who we are as God's people, who we are as a gathered people, how we are to live together, to love each other, to fellowship together, to serve one another as a gathered people. And what concerns him then is our fellowship. Now sometimes for us that word is too thin. We think of fellowship as a meal together. We think of fellowship as our talk before, after church. Maybe we bump into someone and we have fellowship. We have someone over for dinner. And all of that is an aspect of it. But in the New Testament, this word is much richer and deeper. It almost always connotates the idea of partnership. It's koinonia is the root word, but it means our true union together, not just at the spiritual level, but at the visible human level. In which, yes, we fellowship because we enjoy one another and we talk, but there is a deeper bond, a partnership that binds us together. So how will we live the Christian life together as God's people in our church? How will we do that in our homes, at work, and in the world? And that was Paul is beginning to bring together and then to launch out from there. And so we're focusing then on Christian fellowship. We're focusing on Christian partnership, togetherness, if you will. And he begins in verses 10 through 11 with the root of our fellowship in Christ. Now it begins with an imperative, and it's actually the enclosing command of a set of commands that go, went before. 
But I want to just pick up in verse 9, then we'll go back and, and pull those down as we, as we go through the text. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here, there is no Greek or Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Now it opens then with a precept in verse 9, the command in our relationships, here is first what God demands. He demands truthfulness and honesty with one another. Now it's stated as a negative, do not lie. The Lord requires that then we not lie to one another. And this is part of our new covenant ethic. It's higher, it's deeper than the Mosaic law. Mosaic law, particularly in the Ten Commandments, focused on the legal aspect of not bearing false witness against one another in a court. And that's the language of both the Ten Commandments and the others. But now, it's a much deeper, broader, wider application of the truthfulness of God. God who cannot lie. The God who is truth tells us that we are to be truthful with one another. For the devil is the father of lies. He is the, 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 he is the deceiver. And so we as Christians then are to not to lie to one another. <coughs> now this is the last of a cluster of sins that we are to put off. If you back up in verse 8, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk from your mouth, and do not lie to one another. Now notice how these sins are relational sins as a rule. They are things that you do in the presence or against or with someone else. And these are, but these are not just commands that don't have a reason. And the reason is rooted in the past, verses 9 through 10. In other words, it is rooted in what has happened to us. We do not lie because God has transformed us. Now, in the Bible, there would be lots of reasons that we should not lie. That we should tell the truth, grounded in the nature of God. It's over against the nature of Satan. But in this text, Paul wants us to think about this a little differently, to drive it home in a different way. We are not to lie because God has transformed us. We are not to lie because we have believed truths about Christ's work for us and in us. This is the logic of the Bible that sometimes seems to escape most modern Christians. What God in Christ did at the cross and resurrection has already radically transformed us. It's a past tense truth. It is a outside of us reality. So it's a past tense action. Don't lie to each other because you have already put off the old person, the old self. You have already put on the new person, the new self. It is something that has happened to you. It is something that happened to you in your past. This is something that happened to you at your conversion. And that happened to each of you. You have had your old put off and your new put on. Now, that's the reality, but it still entails responsibility. The responsibility to actively, in your life, put off and put on. It's not either or. The mistakes that have been made down through the centuries in Christian 
in Christian thinking about the Christian life is it's tried to make these an either or. Either you are completely transformed and you just rest in that, and if you just rest in that, then therefore righteousness will happen to you. Well, good luck with that. Because, and then there's activism on the other side. So there's passivism in one place, and then there's activism on the other. And that is you have to strive, you have to work, and you do so all on your own, and maybe with the power of the Spirit, and people prodding you along. And good luck with that too. Because <laughs> in the long run, it doesn't work. Because we have to believe the reality and the responsibility in such a way that it emerges with biblical activism. We are to put off these old things and put them on because they have already happened to us. Now, you know, our minds go... And part of this is because we are living incarnational lives. Our lives as Christians are similar to Jesus' life in his incarnation. There is a physical aspect, an in-this-world aspect, in which Jesus is human, and then there is the in-heavens aspect in which Jesus is divine. And so we are working those out together. Now, you know... I feel like I'm peering around this. So, and I told them they didn't have to move it, but. Um, is that better? Hi, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> kept, kept looking around at Mike. <laughs> and so, but we are living this out as spiritual realities within a physical reality that gives these responsibilities. So, <clears throat> Paul locates this important prohibition in something that's already happened to you. It's kind of like Romans 6. Do not allow sin to master you because sin does not master you. Again, we look at that and go, huh? You see, that's why you have to believe it by faith in order to understand it. So we can think of it this way. You have a past reality. Something that has already been accomplished. That reality leads to and empowers your present responsibility. To put it this way, in taking both of the texts that's gone before, put off and put on, because you have already put off and put on. You put to death, mortify, verse 5. What you have already been separated from by the cross death and the Spirit's circumcision. Chapter 2, verse 11. You put on what the resurrection has created in you. That is the life of Christ through the Spirit. Chapter 2, verse 13. And you are to seek and pursue all that is in heaven in Christ. Chapter 3, verse 1. And so you have the responsibility to set your minds on the true heavenly reality. An active pursuit in this world of the reality in heaven, in the new creation, as a part of the new creation. Now this is what it means to preach Christ. Colossians 1, verses 28 through 29 say, Him, referring to Christ, we proclaim. And what's the next? Warning everyone and teaching everyone. Why warning? Well, that's what we're in the middle of, right? So we proclaim Christ, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom to the end, to the purpose, so that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, struggling with all his energy that he powerfully works within me. There it is. In verse 29 is the secret. I work hard because I am confident that God is working hard in me. There it is. To only talk about Jesus and all of his wondrous glories 
is great, it's necessary, but it's not fully preaching Christ. To only talk about Jesus and his death and resurrection and ascension to heaven is not fully preaching Christ. To preach Christ, we must proclaim the realities and the responsibilities. See, Colossians 2, 6 through 3, 17 are full of therefore and since and imperatives that are grounded in and arise from the indicatives. Now, now what do I mean? Oh, man, two big words, indicatives and imperatives. What in the world? Well, the truths about who Christ is and what he has done must be wrapped tightly around the commands for the Christian life. Watchman Nee taught that these were like the two wings of a bird and that you needed both in order to successfully fly, navigate the Christian life. You needed the reality on one wing and you need the responsibility on the other. And when then we have both in our thinking then we will soar. We will soar above the world. Well, if I can put this another way, live a transformed life because you've already been transformed. Live in your responsibilities, the reality that God has declared over you. Become who you are. Do this and don't do that because you've already believed what is true of you, what Christ has done for you. It is believing the truths about Christ that then bring us to be transformed, to be like Christ. It is only when we say, since Christ has died and was raised for you, and since you have put off the old person and put on the pers new person, then you must put off lying and put on telling the truth. Then, and only then, have we truly proclaimed Christ. We preach Christ, warning and instructing every person in all wisdom in order to present you holy and blameless before the Lord. You see, there's a trajectory. But you are not alone in this. There's a process. And second part of verse 10, through all of this, God is at work. Here is what God is doing. Your new self is being renewed. Do you see the present active ongoing sense of that? Your present self is being renewed in knowledge after the image of the one who created it, of his creator. Now boy, there can be a whole sermon on this sentence. So there is a process of renewal, of transformation that is taking place in every believer. Your new person, over the course of your Christian life, is being more and more conformed to Christ. We are being remade, renewed, transformed, conformed, all the verbs of the New Testament, into the image of Christ. Now, the original image of God in you, in Adam, at the very beginning, that was marred and corrupted, but not fully destroyed at creation, has been corrupted and marred and so on by the fall. And you are not born in the Garden of Eden. You are born in the fall. And so the image of God that you inherited as a human being has been corrupted by depravity and sin when you are converted. That image is in the process through the new man of being transformed more and more into Christ. 
and to being like him. So it is now being made new in you. Greek lesson, real brief. It's two words for the word new. You can say it is new in time. It hasn't existed before, and now it is new in time. Or you can say it is new in quality or new in kind. This is a word that's almost always used for new creation. It's the word that's used for your new man. It is a new in quality. It is a new in character. It is that image of God in you marred by the fall that is now being remade in Christ. And it is happening because you are a part of the new creation. If any man is in Christ, he is, he is a new creature. The old is gone, the new has come. And so God is in this process of making you new. You are being transformed because you have already been fully placed into Christ. So there are three facets of the Christian life to keep in mind. First, the once for all application of Christ's death and resurrection to you at your conversion. The once for all application of Christ's death and resurrection to you at your conversion. Paul has all kinds of language for that. Regeneration, renewal, conversion, uh, circumcision, all of that language refers to something that happened to the instant the new birth happened, the Holy Spirit came in, and all of that was applied to you once and for all. This is a spiritual putting off of the old self, the old person, and a putting on the new self, the new person. This is completed at the time that you are regenerated. This is Christ's work for you. And secondly, there is the transforming process that is going on during your life as a Christian where the new self is continually being conformed to the image of Christ. This is done by the renewing of your mind as you grow in knowledge and faith, as you grow in obedience and wisdom. This is Christ's work in you. Then there is the moment-by-moment responsibility that we have to put off the old self's thinking and behaving and to put on the new self's thinking and behaving. Let this mind be in you, this way of thinking that was in Christ. And if Christ's way of thinking is in you, then you are more and more being transformed into the image of Christ. Paul says we have the mind of Christ. And so we are to allow that way of thinking more and more to dominate our lives so that we are being transformed. This is enabled, it's empowered and engaged by believing the truths about Christ's work. So this is Christ's work lived out. In you. Now now let me go back over those. I realize I didn't put those up on the screen. Some of you are madly writing, or writing madly. I don't know which it is. It depends on whether it's an adverb or an adjective. Anyway, the once for all, first, there's the once for all application of Christ's work to you at your conversion. Once for all, done, settled, transformed, new man, old man dead, you see. Second, is the transforming process that's going on during your life as a Christian. Where God is transforming you. It's his work. And then the moment by moment responsibility that we have to put off remaining sin, the old self, and to put on the new person as God puts us in situation after situation which exposes where we haven't or even gives us opportunity to express the new man. Okay? And we need all three. The Christian life in God's will 
and God's wisdom is the outworking of all three in the particulars of your life. Now, brothers and sisters, we've said this for years in biblical counseling. You do not sin in the principles of your life. You sin in the particulars, in the details, in the moment by moment, in the aggravating you know, I, there's a German saying that, um, you know, when, whenever you're late, you get behind somebody, you get stuck behind somebody doing the speed limit. You know, I, I think I'm going to paste that on my dashboard. Well, there's a particular, there's a detail, there's a moment by moment. That's where this is being worked out. You come in and somebody's sitting in your seat. Air conditioning's too cold. Um, whatever, Right? I can go on and on and on. It will be in the daily details of decisions that drive your attitudes and your actions. And each of you have to come to some understanding of who and what your old self is like. Each of you have to work out what the new you is going to be like. This is what Living the Christian life means. So are you ready? Are you ready to put off the sins that are a part of the old you? Are you ready to put into practice the virtues that are a part of the new you? Do an inventory. What sins and folly do you tend toward? What steps of faith and obedience will you take to put them off and to put on their attendant virtues? And so, uh, there is a perspective though in verse 11. Why these particular vices? Why these particular virtues? Well, there's a perspective that is required here are the reasons from the context, but there is one more. Listen to verse 11 again. Here. Where is here? In Christ. In his body. In his gathered people. There is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free. Now why does he pick these? Because in the church at Colossae, there were all these people. Sitting in the room are Greeks and Jews, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarians, uncultured, uncouth, Scythian, dangerous, warrior-like, slave, free. But here, in Christ, in his body, in his gathered church, it's none of this. Christ is all, and he is in all. Now what, why is he saying this? Because it is these kinds of divisions. It's this kind of thinking. This idea of Greek and Jew, of circumcised and uncircumcised, that is driving the sins in the context. We slander, we ang are angry, we are often because these things are how we think. Here is the old person to put off. You see, these things are listed because they are breaches of Christian relationship and fellowship. There is a fundamental perspective that is required of us as Christians. Your primary identity is not in your ethnicity, your nationality, your language, your background, your social status. It is not. Your primary identity is not even, shocker, your family. These are part of the old realm. The old world. Now you cannot live separate from them, but you cannot allow them to be the reason that you sin against each other. I've just come from a country where this is a huge issue 
in the churches. Tribalism, pride of language, pride of history. Our primary identity is that you are all in Christ. He is who we are. Our primary identity is that we are all Christians. And Christ is all that matters. Christ is in us corporately. We are the body of Christ. We are the community of the church. Being a part of Christ's church is not an addition to your life. It is your life. That's true. Whether you recognize it or not. You either living like that's true. Or you deny that it's true. And therefore your life looks like that. See, this is the answer to all the divisions in society and the church. Stop making your identity, your significance, wrapped up entirely in your old self, in your old person. All of these distinctions in verse 11 are a part of the old you, the old self. And while they do exist in the world, and they are a part of the visual diversity of the church, they are not your identity. They are not who you are. You are Christ's, and Christ is all. Now, so what does this mean then? Well, we work this out then in the relationships of our fellowship in Christ. In the context of your challenge of, as a diverse group of people with the tendency to treat each other according to your old self, what must be put on instead? Here's the other half of the story. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Now let's think about this. Notice in verse 12, there's a motivation in our relationships. The scriptures often give you motivations for their instructions and imperative. And the command here is to put on, but the motivation is threefold. Put on because God has chosen you. You have been selected by God in eternity past to be a part of his church, his body. But more is implied because of the context. In other words, God has chosen each of you. That each of you is a Christian is God's choice. You don't get to choose who to love as a brother and sister. Since God chose you and all those around you, you should feel a powerful urge to put on all these virtues that are related to our relationships as Christians. Second motivation God has made you holy. Now I know we tend to think of holiness as a process from something to something, but not here. Not in this context. This is a simple declaration that God has made you a saint. A holy one. And since you are one of the holy ones, the saints around you, then you should feel a powerful urge to put on all the virtues related to our relationships as Christians. Third motivation, God has chosen you. God has made you holy. And thirdly, God has loved you. You are beloved of God. Each of you is beloved of God. If He has chosen you and made you holy, you have been regenerated because you have been loved by God. Every Christian you know has been loved by God. So think carefully about how you should treat those who are so loved by God. And they're loved in such a way that He chose them and that He made them holy. Since you are one of the beloved ones, you should feel a powerful urge to put on all the virtues that are related to our relationships as Christians. Now, 
if you do not feel motivated by these three truths to put on what follows, problem is not with the Bible. Problem is with you. Quite simply, Paul expects you to have a surge of initiative and desire because he chose you. He made you a saint. And he has loved you as every Christian around you. So do you? If not, then you need to think about what would motivate you. And then ask, why that instead of the Bible's motivations? And so there's a motivation of our relationships, and then there's the maintenance of it. What are we then to put on in our Christian relationships? Put on compassion or hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if one has a complaint against each other, forgiving. Here's an illustrative, not exhaustive list of what you must put on. I don't believe, I, um, most of you would do well to start here. Begin here. Thinking about the COVID time and post-COVID struggles, this was deeply needed and often violated. Just briefly, let's survey these and ask ourselves some really hard questions. Put off all of those things and put this on, a compassionate heart. Are you willing, consciously, intentionally, to put on a poise of heart to be compassionate, to feel for others instead of being harsh, unfeeling, and judgmental, are you? Being compassionate is, is not something that happens to you. It is something that you choose to put on. Kindness. Are you a kind person? Are you willing to put on kindness with others who are your brothers or sisters? In case you were wondering, this does include your spouses. It does include your parents. Kindness. Humility. Humility. Interesting. How do you put on being humble? Because it seems like as soon as you're aware of it, you're not anymore. Are you able to accept hardness, correction, being sinned against, to take the lowly place, the unrecognized ministry? Those are the evidences of having put on humility. Meekness. Are you willing to put on meekness? Are you poised to be submissive, helpful, serving, even when in a leadership position? Meekness. Patience. Are you willing to put on being patient? Now here, it's not being patient with God. It's not being patient with circumstances. It's not being patient with your car who won't start today. It's being patient with, talk to me, others, with people. Well, I can be patient with everything but people. Will you be patient with people, with circumstances, with slowness of change, with all that is involved in really loving others? Remember, remember, you were chosen. All of you were declared to be saints. All of you are loved. And bearing with one another. Are you willing to put on a sincere desire to get along with even those who seem hard to get along with? How much of another person's crap are you willing to put up with? Pardon me. I have a question. How much of yours does Jesus put up with? Forgiveness. Some of you are going to have to forgive me for using that word. Are you willing to immediately and fully forgive when you have a complaint against someone? Do you even understand why forgiveness is necessary? And do you even know what it means to forgive? 
Well, just to make sure we understand, then Paul gives us the measure for our relationships, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you. So you also must forgive. This is the only one that Paul comments on, forgiveness. You are a forgiven person. You would not be a Christian without God's forgiveness. You would not have fellowship with God without his forgiveness. You would not be a saint without his forgiveness. And because you are beloved, you have been forgiven. So God's forgiveness is purchased by the cross and centered on Christ. And God always forgives. And so must you. A forgiving attitude, a poise of forgiveness is a way of thinking we have to put on. We should be quick to confess your sins to one another, against one another, but you should be even quicker to forgive offenses and complaints and sins against one another. You do so not on any grounds, but that these sins have already been dealt with at the cross. When you refuse to forgive, you are effectively saying the cross is not enough. I want my own justice. I'm going to make you suffer. Now, is there anyone in this room whom you have not forgiven? Is there anyone in this room you are not poised to forgive? Start with your spouse. They are your closest brother and sister. How do you know that you are unforgiving? Who do you avoid? Who are you bitter against? Who will you not serve under? Or who will you not serve with? Who would you rather see something bad happen to rather than something good? And then there's the mastery of our relationships in verse 14. How is all this possible? What could possibly cause you to respond to others in the ways that we ought? And above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Put on love. Now, yes, we're not talking about a feeling. The affections may become a part of it, but they are not the core of it. Love is the willingness to serve and sacrifice for others, even those who are against you. Love is a choice. Love is something you do, not something that happens to you. Put on love. Even God's kind of love. What are the results of believers putting off and putting on in the context of relationships? Harmony. Love then binds people together in harmony. When harmony is broken between people, then love has waned or died altogether. When harmony exists, even when there are differences, then love has prevailed. Sadly, many, many breaches of harmony during the last two years are evidences of not putting on love as the bond that binds us together. Well, there's the responsibilities of our fellowship in Christ in verses 15 to 17. Three central commands follow as our responsibilities in our Christian life. Now, other other circumstances, I'd probably stop here because of the time. But verse 15 opens with the word and. And it's a strong and which means Russ can't stop. (laughs) And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. First, you are to allow the peace of Christ to rule in all your hearts. This is not a text on personal guidance. This has absolutely nothing to do with whether or not to buy a house. This is a text about corporate oneness and harmony. You are to allow the desire to be at peace, to govern each of your hearts, so that we all together strive to be at peace with one another. This is the peace of Christ. This is the kind of resolved oneness that is exhibited by Christ, comes from Christ, and seeks to glorify Christ. Now, don't think 
You are exempt. If you have been called into the one body of Christ, you have been summoned to live at peace with one another. Peace faking and peace breaking are deep breaches of the peace of Christ and the body of Christ. What must accompany the peace of Christ? Did you hear it? Gratitude. Gratitude is the answer to grumbling and complaining. A grace-filled heart will be a gratitude-expressing heart. And second, we must allow the word of Christ in all its richness to live at home in you all. This is both individual and corporate. You must allow the word to settle down, to live at home in your inner being. Whether it is the scripture you read, the word you hear preached or taught, or the word spoken and sung to each other. Being a word-filled people will lead to fruitful instruction and admonition. It will replace complaining and grumbling and criticism. And the overflow of the word in us and among us will be word-filled singing. There will be a way of not only singing to God, but also singing about Christ to each other. From our word-filled hearts and word-filled gatherings will flow word-filled songs in a variety of styles and tunes and songs. The word-filled praise will infuse, infused with gratitude for who Christ is and what he has done for each and all of us. And here is the guide, here is the goal, the glory of the Christian life in everything. In everything you do, do it for the glory of Christ. Now Paul is thinking about our relationships, our fellowship, our partnership as Christians. So in everything, as individuals, do all to the glory of God. And all that we do as a church, do all to the Lord's glory. So what will bring glory to the Lord? when we proclaim Christ in all the fullness of these texts. When we put off our old selves and put on our new selves. When we live with each other as servants and sacrifices. When we put off the old sins and put on the new virtues. When we are filled with Christ's peace and love and word. Then we will bring glory to Jesus. If we aim our lives to the glory of Jesus, we will do so with gratitude and thankfulness. Do you hear it? Every sentence in this paragraph is infused with thankfulness to God. Let me wrap this up. We have done much gospel-grounded, Christ-centered teaching from Colossians. It is the message of the book just as it is the message of the whole Bible. Now the question is, do you believe what you have heard so that you can understand it and live it. Have you put away anger and wrath and malice, slander and obscene talk and lying to one another? Take personal inventory. Think of a who am I angry with, wrath with, so on with each of these. Are you being renewed more and more to be like Christ? Are you being transformed? Are you making progress in Christ's likeness? Are you intentionally, actively putting on a compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, and having a complaint against one another, forgiveness and love? Are you making progress? Are you moving forward? Are you struggling to fellowship or serve with anyone? Why? And what will you do about it now? And by the way, I'm not going to do anything about it is the wrong and even sinful answer. Brothers and sisters, will you love and live and serve, sacrifice and forgive one another as God in Christ has loved and lived and served and sacrificed and forgiven you? Do you truly want the gospel-grounded, Christ-centered, cross-taking life that glorifies God? Long sermon, I know, Father, but I pray that it would go down deep into our hearts. We would think deeply and take inventory 
repent where we need to rejoice in progress that you have caused believe the realities and the responsibilities and may we make progress we ask this because we know we are confident we are sure this will glorify jesus